from the Grosvenor House in London's Park Lane. It's the Pride of Britain Award. Please welcome your host, Carol Vorderman. Highness, Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, and the Hoff. Hello and welcome to the Daily Mirror's Pride of Britain Awards. Tonight, as you know, is the night we celebrate the people who make our country great. It's a night of heroes, the unsung heroes, people whose courage, selflessness and dedication is simply awe-inspiring. And I'm delighted to see that here with us, to pay tribute to them, we've been joined by a glittering array of VIP guests. There is no room quite like this one. We have someone who runs the country, Theresa May, someone who'd like to run the country, Jeremy Corbyn, and someone who thinks he runs the country, Simon Cowell. <laughs> uh, Professor Stephen Hawking is here. He taught Richard Hammond his theory of time, and then he moved table and taught Joey Essex how to tell the time. <laughs> we have Knights of the Realm, Sir Tom Jones and Sir Cliff Richard. <laughs> we have more dames than panto season in Blackpool. Dames Joan Collins, Babs Windsor, Kelly Holmes, and on and on the list goes. We've even got a saint. Where is Mary Berry, by the way? <laughs> but tonight's a particularly special occasion because we're joined by His Royal Highness Prince Charles as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Prince's Trust. And as ever, the real stars are, of course, our winners. And to give us a taste of what's coming up, here are the two great Michaels of the acting world, Sir Michael Caine and Michael Sheen. We remember our heroes, remember them forever. We learn their names, their faces, feel their places in our hearts. We know their pain, their sacrifices and passions. We hold them close. Space, here I come. So today, now here, who will we remember? Whose faces, passions and pain? Where are today's heroes? What are their names? Young man came like an angel, a guardian angel. Today's heroes are all around us. We really were saving their lives. They are our neighbors, our relatives, and friends. They are ordinary people. You and me. Is my best mate and I didn't want to lose him. Dylan is not a normal child, he's an angel. In extraordinary times of sacrifice, bravery, belief and humility. You have to do something in that moment. I said, I'm going to make something of myself. All around us, they inspire us, move us, change us all for good. I'm not having this. I have to find a cure my boys. That was my breaking point where I thought, stop being negative. We hold them close. And they will have places in our hearts forever. This is the Daily Mirror's Pride of Britain Awards. Our winners tonight span the generations. They come from all over the country and from all walks of life, most of them you've never heard of before. But our next winner is already becoming a singing superstar with legions of fans, including a certain James Corden. Hello to everyone at Pride of Britain from the Late Late Show here in Los Angeles. Now, as many of you may know, one of my favourite leisure activities is to cruise along the city's carpool lane with some of the world's biggest stars singing along to their greatest hits. I'm still standing! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Bobbity bum, bobbity bum. I'm still standing! <laughs> baby, 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 oh, I'm like baby, baby. But 
there's a carpool karaoke superstar that I want to pay tribute to this evening. He's 80 years old. He has the voice of Frank Sinatra, and instead of Sunset Boulevard, he likes to cruise the mean streets of Blackburn, Lancashire. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Ted McDermott and his son, Simon. <laughs> Ever since 80-year-old Ted McDermott was a Butlin's red coat in the 70s, he's loved singing. That's where I met him. I couldn't get over his singing voice. I thought it was absolutely marvellous. My heart melted. <laughs> Ted's massive repertoire of songs blew everyone away. You'd see the band going, what song is he going to do next? They called him the song a minute, man. It just stuck, really. But when Ted was 75, his family noticed a worrying change in his sonny character. His memory wasn't quite as good and sharp as it used to be. That's when I first thought, oh, something's not right here. Then after that, it was a gradual decline. Ted was diagnosed with dementia. He forgets who I am and he forgets where my mum is. You do uh, get upset about it. The person that you knew is slowly going away. But in May this year, something extraordinary happened when Simon put on a CD and captured the moment on his mobile phone. Now, tell me when will you be mine? It was madness, you know, because, like, my dad was in the back singing. It was back to the old self, really, was that. No matter cry now. Simon began posting videos of Ted singing on the internet with a link for people to donate money to the Alzheimer's Society. Right, the first note. I can remember when we walked together. The videos have raised over 128,000 pounds. Down this street before. And they've had over 250 million views worldwide. Brilliant, that is Simon. Fantastic. Make me feel so young. Ted has since gone into Abbey Road recording studios to make a single, which has raised even more money for the Alzheimer's Society. The whole experience has completely put the whole family closer together. I mean, it's given my daddy's dream. He's not fully aware of it, but he would be exceedingly proud of it. I should explain, this award is for the two of you. This is all my dad's award, you know. And uh, where is he tonight? Because um, my dad's condition, he really can't be here. Um, he's back at home in Blackburn, probably watching it now on TV with my mum. She'd have loved to be here tonight, and this is totally my mum's kind of thing, but, you know, <laughs> this award, and my dad would definitely want to say this, this is, both me and my dad would say, this is an award for my mum, you know, and it's my mum, Linda, Linda McDermott in Blackburn. It's her award. So, who can we get to present your award? <laughs> we have two huge supporters of Alzheimer's Charities. Uh, a knight who's used to singing congratulations, <laughs> Sir Cliff Richard. And there's nothing like a dame, especially when it comes to this one, Dame Joan Collins. <laughs> So good to meet you. Thank you, thank you. This is my dame. <laughs> and this is my knight. Isn't it great to have him back? <laughs> yes. Simon, I have to say, tonight for me, it's been like success and suffering. And it seems to me that what we've seen tonight is that success can overcome suffering. And I found it really, really inspiring to be here. What I've seen tonight absolutely destroys everything I went through for two years. It was nothing. Uh, nothing. I'm so pleased to meet you and uh, loved your video. <laughs> I can't believe that your dad now sells more records than I do. <laughs> Your award, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Candice, thank you. Thank you, Cliff, and thank you, Joe. Congratulations to the McDermott.
In addition to unearth this year's winners, our team of researchers left no stone unturned. They scoured newspapers, the internet and more to find stories worthy of placing before our panel of judges. Thousands more nominations poured in from Daily Mirror readers, ITV viewers and customers of our partners TSB. And the good news is that across the length and breadth of the country, we found countless examples of kindness, of courage and of compassion. But to find our next winner, we had to join her thousands of followers online. Hi YouTube, it's Nikki from Nikki Lily. Now today I am doing a video called Nikki. I get a lot of comments on my videos saying what's wrong with your face. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how it turned out like this. Nikki, when she was born, she was the most unbelievably bouncy baby you could have, really. Very happy, very energetic, loved dancing, just full of life. I started out with just some veins popping up on the right side of my face. They found out I have an AVM, arteriovenous malformation. It's extremely rare. The type that Nikki has is basically uh, three in a million. My blood vessels and veins collide, which causes me to have life-threatening nosebleeds. I just remember how I felt, very empty, very shocked. We went from utter elation at six years old to our world just, you know, crumbling. I used to look at myself in the mirror and think, where have I gone, you know? I've had about 24 operations and hospital appointments, I've had over 300. She used to come home crying because someone would make a comment on her face and be like, oh, what happened to you? And she'd get really upset. She was actually a prisoner in her own house. I used to get a flannel and wet it and, like, scrub my face because I couldn't believe it was not going to come off. That was my breaking point where I thought, stop being negative. You need to get out of this. When I was eight, I started my YouTube channel which I'm talking to you guys on today. I do makeup videos, so tutorials. I do baking videos. Mm. I do lots. That's really good. My Leavers Prom makeup videos got one and a half million views. There are people out there with facial problems who feel different. And Nikki shows them that it's, it's OK to be different. It's OK to be yourself. I get so many amazing comments from my videos. Nikki, you're a role model to people who have a disability and not confident with themselves. Amazing video. I suffer from health issues too, and I've pretty much given up hope recently. But after listening to you, let's just say I've learnt a lesson from an 11-year-old. I have 74,000 subscribers, which is absolutely insane. <laughs> It's just nice to know that I can change someone's day for the better. Do I look beautiful? She's definitely the bravest person I know. She, I could never do what she does. I love you so much. Bye. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our child of courage, Nikki Christie. I just want to take you back now when you told your mum and dad that you were going to set up uh, a video system online and you were going to join YouTube and so on. Were they worried about you? Were they worried about that kind of exposure? I think they were scared that I may get the hateful or negative comment, but I think they just knew that this could potentially be something to help me or make me happy. And it is a problem now, isn't it? There are a lot of haters around. What yeah. would you say to those people? Um, I think... I've learned that haters, like, it's more about them than it is you, really, and... Uh, OK, so, when did you last look at your YouTube page? Um, I think it was about an hour ago. About an hour ago. <laughs> um, OK, now you love the baking thing, don't yeah. you? And I'm now let's just have a look at your page. Oh, look, who's there? Well done, Nikki. Can you see that? Um, that's Mary Berry. Mary Berry the cock. Well done, Nikki. Keep baking, love Mary. Cool. Kiss, <laughs> kiss. That... Oh, my gosh. <laughs>
Oh, well, to present your award, please welcome the nation's queen of baking, Mary Berry, newly crowned Bake Off winner, Candice Brown, and the king of the kitchen, Jamie Oliver. Inspirational. I gather you've paid £250,000 yes. for AVM, and on YouTube you have millions who view you. I think the Bake Off better watch out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you to Mary, to Jamie, and congratulations to uh, Candice, but most of all, Let's say a huge congratulations to our child of courage, Nikki Christie. Coming up. Right then, Eric Clapton, Brian May, watch this. Peter Kay springs a cunning surprise on one of our winners. Britain Awards to tell us about our next award on behalf of this morning. Please welcome a man who, like a fine wine, just gets better with age. Ladies and gentlemen, the silver fox himself, Mr. Philip Schofield. The This Morning the Emergency Services Award honours members of our emergency teams who have gone above and beyond the call of duty in their work. <laughs> Tonight's winners are using their skill and expertise to tackle a growing problem on Britain's roads. Last year, over 500 pedestrians and cyclists were killed and more than 8,000 seriously injured on Britain's roads. We've seen an increasing number of cyclists and pedestrians being literally get sucked under the wheels of large articulated lorries. A lot of these patients have very, very severe pelvic fractures and, more importantly, catastrophic bleeding within the pelvis. A quarter of accident victims with serious pelvic injuries die before getting to hospital. We had to do something to try and save their lives. Specialists at the Royal London Hospital and London's Air Ambulance spent two years developing a procedure called Reboa. A balloon is inserted via an artery in the leg, threaded up into the major blood vessel near the heart and inflated to block the blood supply. It literally turns the tap off. But the pioneering technique had only ever been used in the controlled environment of the hospital itself. The problem is it is far more necessary out of hospital. In December 2014, medics from London's air ambulance were called to an accident. A television crew happened to be on the scene and recorded the whole incident. 24-year-old Victoria Lebrec, cycling to work, had been critically injured. The wheels had gone over her pelvis and her legs, and she was obviously bleeding. There's a circulation, she's got no radial. We couldn't even record a blood pressure. She was very rapidly going into a state of unconsciousness. We were going to lose her. It was clear that she was not going to survive to hospital, so we had to get the team with Roberta and with blood to her. This was a desperate situation. Can we have silence now, please? Can I have the um, balloon, Sam? Yeah. When this balloon goes in, it's going to stop the blood flow below her distal aorta. So we really... OK, balloon's up, Simon. She suddenly generated a blood pressure. Everything began to improve. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. On you. It felt like we really were saving her life right then. It was a huge breakthrough. The first time Reboa had been successfully used at the roadside. Victoria had a leg amputated, but pulled through. Most people that have an accident like that don't survive it. So I feel really grateful that they saved my life. I'm really lucky that they were there and able to do that procedure. Since then, the team have saved three more people at the roadside with Reboa. The hope is that it can now be rolled out worldwide to save many more. I really do believe that we saved Victoria's life, and that's something that makes everything worthwhile. Please welcome the winners of the This Morning Emergency Services, Dr Simon Walsh, Dr Sammy Sadek, Bill Leaning, Sam Margetts and Dean Bateman.
What does Reboa actually stand for? <laughs> <laughs> your turn, <laughs> your job. <Yeah. laughs> it stands for resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. Yes, I knew that, yeah. of course. <laughs> to present their award, fresh from his grand tour, is a man who owes his life to the emergency services. Richard Hammond and one of the nation's favourite singers, Catherine Jenkins. I'm in awe of Hello, all of you, how you think like that in such a pressurised environment. You're, you're all amazing. Here we go. <laughs> I want to talk to Sammy, no particular reason. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a skilled man, I just wanted to talk. I wanted to know, because you were one of the team who developed this technique for use at the roadside. So you've worked it out, you know how it should work. Mm. But then you were doing it for real with a patient, Victoria, with seconds to live. Pressure? <laughs> Lots of pressure. Um, there I was doing it in front of a film crew, and more importantly with this poor girl. Bleeding to death. We're talking seconds now, yes. not even minutes. Yes. Yeah. We have someone here who would like to say a very big thank you. The cyclist they saved that day, Victoria Lebrecht. What would you like to say to them? Oh, I'm going to cry now. Me <laughs> too. Um, but just a massive thank you for all the work that you've done. And, you know, you're going to continue saving so many lives with all of this. So just, yeah, a massive thank you. Well done. Well done, all of you. Thank you, Catherine, Richard, Philip. Thank you, Victoria. And congratulations once more to our Emergency Services Award winners. Our next award goes to a parent who suffered an unimaginable loss. But instead of giving up, she chose to give hope to others. When Karen Johnson's son, Simon, was born, he seemed like any healthy little boy. I couldn't have been happier. Um, I loved every bit of my pregnancy and I loved being a mum. But when Simon was 18 months old, he was diagnosed with a degenerative genetic condition, Hunter syndrome. It was devastating to be told that there was nothing that could be done and that he would deteriorate into a brain-damaged child who was unable to do anything for himself. I knew I'd cope, practically, because I'm a very practical person, but I didn't know if I was going to fall apart. Karen was pregnant with another boy at the time. There was a 50-50 chance her baby would have the same condition. There's no words to describe being told that your child is going to die. And the baby that's yet to even be born could possibly die as well. When Karen gave birth to her second son, Mikey, the diagnosis was confirmed. I just went into fight mode, into, I'm not having this. I have to find a cure for my boys. And started fundraising. Karen set up her own charity, The Gem Appeal. And when she heard doctors researching the gene at the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital wanted to extend their lab, she was keen to help. I said, how much do you want? And he said, £250,000. Within two years, we'd raised the full £250,000 and the building was on its way being built. I'd got the bug then for, for fundraising and I knew, I knew I could make a difference. But Karen was dealt another devastating blow when her daughter, was diagnosed with leukemia. It felt like the floor was made of treacle. I wanted to run away. I couldn't run away from any of it. Because my kids and my beautiful babies, you have to carry on. You have to do it for your children. Mikey turned out to be a perfect match for his younger sister and a successful bone marrow transplant saved Katie's life. But Simon and Mikey's condition got worse, and both boys died aged 12. I hated what was happening. I hated life. I hated it all. But you carry on. Karen battled through her grief, and her fundraising continued. 
She has since raised more than two and a half million pounds, helping to fund new treatment, which slows down the symptoms of Hunter syndrome, benefiting children like 12 year old Harry. Go on, Harry, you did it. Harry's a happy and healthy boy at the moment because of the research and the treatment that's there. It's amazing that people like Karen have done that. It's all thanks to her. I think she's amazing. Simon and Mikey would be so proud. They'd be looking down on her and be like, yeah, go, Mum. Please welcome Karen Johnson. Unimaginable to think how you survived that, to be honest, Karen. Um, it's been a journey. Um, sheer determination um, and the love and support of the people around me. Katie, obviously, my wonderful husband, Pete, and my mum and dad, who all pulled together and raised the money with us. It's actually 2.8 million now. We have little tiny functions, we rattle tins at supermarkets through to glittering balls in Manchester and all over the country now. You found out about your Pride of Britain award at one of these I did. I did. <laughs> okay, shall we um, just have a look at yes. how you found out? I'm here, look. <laughs> First in the hospital social club, the bloody big time. <laughs> right then, Eric Clapton, Brian May, watch this. Here we go. And I thought I'd join you. Peter K, my old time hero. I just love Peter K. Go, Johnny, go, go. It's all been a big charade. It's all been a big lie, love. She's only gone and won a bloody Pride of Britain award. Pride of Britain! Come up here, Karen. You won a Pride of Britain. Pride of Britain! With a double shovel. We were wondering, who on earth could we get to present the award, OK? OK, so, a few clues now, and you've got to guess who it is, OK? OK. They wanted to be here to see you shine and to remind you, never forget where you've come here from. Yes, they're back for the next five minutes, they are... Take that. Take that! Woo! Hello. <laughs> oh, okay, that's it. Well, congratulations to you. Are you all right? How does it feel? <laughs> well, listen. Listen, what, what, Karen, what, what, what you've achieved is inspirational and breathtaking. And, and on behalf of us and everyone who's watching, I'm sure, thank you for being you. Oh, and congratulations. Thank you. Well done. Coming up, a driver is trapped in this burning car, caught on a motorway camera. I don't think I'd be able to live with myself if, I, if I'd laughed and not helped her. This is the Daily Mirror's Pride of Britain Awards. To introduce our next winner, our two presenters who'll be regretting that second bottle of Lambrini when their alarms go off at half three tomorrow. Good morning, Britain's Susanna Reid and Ben Shepherd. <laughs> Good morning, 
favourite Young Fundraiser of the Year award celebrates someone under the age of 15 who's raised money for charity in an inspiring and imaginative way. Yeah, and tonight's winner has used her imagination and exceptional talent in spades to inspire hundreds of people to donate money to a very good cause. Let's hear her story. My name is Rhea. I love to paint, and this is one of my paintings. 11-year-old Rhea Cara from London has an extraordinary talent for painting, and she has been using her gift to do something truly amazing. Three years ago, Rhea's school asked the children to raise money for a charity called Reverse Rhett, which funds research to find a cure for Rhett syndrome. Rhea's friend, Hannah, has the condition, which strikes mostly girls between their first and second birthday, leaving them with multiple disabilities. I was just really moved because I thought that it would be so horrible to have Rhett because you wouldn't be able to express your emotions or talk to people. Rhea decided that she'll do what it takes to help these young girls and the idea to paint canvases and sell them at our local village fete was born that night. So I sent myself a challenge to paint 100 canvases in 100 days. Um, and all the money I'd get from that, I would give to the charity. Every time she has a spare moment, she'll be up in her room and she'll be sitting over a canvas and she'll be painting. Rhea smashed her target by painting and selling 166 paintings in 100 days, raising almost £4,000. When Rhea raised that much money, she could not believe that what she had done in her first year was not sufficient to find a cure for Hannah. That's when I decided that no matter how long it takes, I just keep on fundraising till they find a cure. Rhea has now sold more than 400 pieces of art, raising over £13,000 for the charity. The money that Rhea has raised will go directly to research. It helps take us closer to the cure. We definitely need a lot more Rhea's in the world. I'm just very proud of her. Gentlemen, please welcome the Good Morning Britain Young Fundraiser of the Year, Rhea Cara. Rhea, you have such an exceptional talent as an artist. Is this something that you want to carry on doing? Yes, definitely, because um, Hannah is just... She didn't do anything to deserve the horrible situation mm -hmm. she's in. So I'm going to keep on fundraising till they find a cure. Like, no matter how long it takes, I'll keep on going. Goodness me. <laughs> You're this fantastic young girl. You've done so much. And to honour you with the award, we whisked you off to a mysterious art dealer interested in your work. Yeah. Let's see how that went. <laughs> Now, Raya doesn't know she's coming to meet me. Raya is an entrepreneur. She thinks she's coming to meet an art dealer who's going to display all of her artwork. Mummy, do you think he'll like them? I'm sure he will. Hello, Raya. Hi. You thought you were going to meet a art dealer, yes. didn't you? Yeah. Yes, you didn't expect to see me. No. But I'm not an art dealer, as you know. <laughs> I'll tell you what I have got for you. You have won the Pride of Britain Award. There's your invitation oh, for the gosh. event. Wow. Thank you. Oh, my God. Brilliant. Now, I'm going to set you a little task, OK? I want you to go away and paint a nice picture, a great one, because it's going to be auctioned, and I reckon they're going to raise lots and lots of money. Very well done. Thank you. Now, you're a great fan of Lord Sugar, aren't you? Was he scarier than you imagined, or just as scary? Um, I think he was actually really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we need to give you your prize. We have a pair of artful dodgers indeed. No oil paintings themselves. Please welcome onto the stage Anton Deck. Not only are you exceptionally talented, but you've used that talent selflessly to raise money for other people and you really deserve that award. Thank so you. enjoy it. Well done, Rhea. Well done, Rhea. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Excuse me.
excuse me, hang on a minute. Yeah. You had two jobs. What was, what was the other one? One was to bring the award. Yes. Remember the painting? Auction the painting. Was I meant to bring them? You're meant to bring was it. Was I? You were. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. The, the backstage. Susanna. Yes. If you want something doing, get the girls to do it. Am I right? <laughs> Emma and Jerry. Congratulations. Amazing. Thank you. They are fantastic. Those are Raya's two paintings. So to make up for your bad behaviour... Carol. What? I've already brought one. What? I've got a gavel. <laughs> Are you going to do this? <laughs> Should we auction them right now? Yeah. Simon Cowell's in the room. Indeed. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. One million one pounds. Million. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Simon, give us a bid. Give us a bid. Ten grand. Ten grand? Is there anybody else in the room? We've got young Mr. Tomlinson there. Absolutely loaded as well. Louis, yeah. would you like to? Yeah. <laughs> Louis Tomlinson? 15. 15? I'll tell you what we could do. I'll tell you what we could do. 15 for one. Who's going to up their bid to 15 for the other one? And we'll stop. Simon? Simon. Yeah. 15. Yeah. So, well done. To Rhea and Back with the Spices, and to Deb, Ben, and Susanna. This year's award for outstanding bravery goes to someone who the judging panel felt is one of life's good Samaritans. This dramatic CCTV footage shows the terrifying moment when a pensioner's car burst into flames. I was horror-struck. I thought to myself, I've had it. The driver, 73-year-old Anne Wade, somehow managed to pull over onto a slip road. I could see flames engulfing the windscreen in front of me. With the central locking burnt out, Anne was trapped. <laughs> Worse still, the car was rapidly filling with toxic smoke. Nobody was stopping. I was thinking, why isn't somebody coming to, to help me? Don't worry, I'm gonna get you out. A young man came, like an angel, a guardian angel. The angel who did stop was 24-year-old supermarket worker Will Edwards from Wrexham. Couldn't see anybody else prepared to stop. I knew I had to do something in that moment. He's... Open the door, come on! Eventually, other drivers did pull in and called 999. They were shouting at me, you know, get away, it's going to blow up. It's going to explode! He just ignored them. Completely no fear for his own life. I knew that she didn't have long. In his desperation to save Anne, Will grabbed a wheel wrench. Turn your face away! The broken glass had sliced deep into Will's hand. He just carried on. Go on! I had to be now or never. I yanked her out of the vehicle. Oh, Will pulled Anne to safety eight minutes before the fire crew got there. A Will's definitely a hero in our eyes. By the time we had arrived on scene, I think it would have been too late to have saved her. Another couple of minutes and I would have been dead. I don't think I'd be able to live with myself if, I, if I'd left and not helped her. I think he's wonderful. Please welcome Will Edwards. <laughs> it's quite an extraordinary thing to do, Will. You know, I'm very grateful for everybody choosing for me to be here because in my head, I could never dream of being here in my entire life. So thank you very much, everybody. Well, on that day, you proved that you're pretty nifty on your feet there, and there are a lot of people here who are also pretty good on their feet, not quite in the same way. Mm -hmm. Please welcome the cast of Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> Now, I've 
Yeah, who brought the award on? Anybody? Um, something we're missing. missing. Somebody, we're missing. We're missing. Something <laughs> missing. Well, in your current day job, you're in charge of a supermarket's home delivery service. Are I you am not? indeed, you yes. You are, sir. So to get your award, I've actually arranged a special delivery for you. <laughs> Should be here any time now. Service. Late. Part of your day job to save somebody's life. It's not part of our day job to be dancing on TV, but I've got to say, <laughs> you are so much braver than any of us in this room. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Will Edwards. Coming up. A truly exceptional winner and her first little steps to a big recovery. This is the Pride of Britain Awards. There can't be many people who've spent as much of their lives in hospital as our next young award winner. But in spite of that, she inspires others, always keeping a smile on her beautiful face. In 2007, Emma and Kyle Sawford had a baby girl, Tilly. I was really excited that we had our first girl. We finally got our princess. She was very troublesome. <laughs> just very happy and cheerful and, and just brilliant. One morning, when Tilly was just 15 months old, life for her happy family took a tragic turn. I decided to take some washing downstairs and then heard a scream. Tilly had been climbing on a beanbag next to the bath and fell in. She was just standing in the bath and with no skin on. A hot tap had been left on and because of a fault with the boiler, the water was scalding. Her eyes rolled at the back of her head. I thought we'd lost her there and then. Tilly's injury, she had burns to 86% of her total body surface area. At the time, no child of that age had survived so severe an injury. They came and told us, don't leave her side because she isn't going to make it through the night. Tilly almost died seven times, but after 12 hours of surgery, incredibly, she survived. I do wish that it was me and not her having to go through all this and the pain that she's been in. Since her accident eight years ago, Tilly's had over 500 operations including having to have her leg amputated. But there's no stopping this brave little girl. Every star tells a story. A story that I survived. Nothing at all will phase her. Like when she's in the hospital and she's going around telling other children it's going to be fine and it's not going to hurt. Nine-year-old Tilly has also taken on a role as the face of the Principal Trust Children's Charity, which sends ill and disadvantaged children and their families on holidays. I like helping other children. Just shows other burn survivors that they can actually just go out and be who they are. Against the odds, Tilly's living life to the full. Tilly's in a band called Little Skips. Mama told me not to waste my life. The band actually started when she was in hospital, and her and the nurses would sing and dance to Little Mix songs. And then she went to school and brought a group of girls together. Wings are meant to fly. My sister is the very bravest person in the whole white world. Now, this is only the fourth time that Tilly's walked since the accident when she was 15 months old, so please give her a huge round of applause. She's coming up the ramp now with her mum, Emma, Tilly Sawford. Beautiful dress I've ever seen, Tilly Sawford. Thank you. Now, we were just watching you with those amazing singers, friends of yours, in a band called... Little Skips. Little Skips. A little while ago, you had the surprise about finding out about Pride of Britain, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, OK. So, um, shall we look at what happened on that day? Mix. 
we're here at ITV to surprise the lovely Tilly with the Pride of Britain Award. She's here with her girl band, Little Skip. Yeah! And they think, they put them in a music video, but I think they're going to be shocked when we walk in. Action. We're here to give you a Pride of Britain award because you are so amazing and so brave. And we're here to give you the invitation for the big night. Yay! Yay! I can't believe I'm at Little Mix. And they can detain you because wings are made to fly. Yay! Oh, wow. I had the best day ever. I'm sure your mum, Emma, would agree that watching that, they have got the X Factor, haven't yeah. they, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, but you don't have to take it from us, you know, because we've got quite the whole of the X Factor here. Yeah. Simon Cowell, Nicole Dermot and Louis Walsh. when Little Skips are going to be auditioning for us on one of our shows. Oh, because yeah. Little Mix saw you and they're now nervous. Next year. Next year, she says. Okay. That is a binding agreement, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. We have a deal. And you get quite a bit more. Isn't that Thank wonderful? Thank you. Congratulations to our Pride of Paris, Tilly Stalkers. We've got a lot of powerful politicians with us tonight who make laws on a daily basis, but occasionally, very occasionally, it's people living normal lives like the rest of us who can make a real difference. Let's meet the Groves family. You knew when Lil came in the room because there was just something about her. She just had this aura around her. Lillian's smile just went from ear to ear. She always had a smile on her face. It was her smile that lit up the room. In 2010, 14-year-old Lillian Groves was playing football with her little brother outside her home in Croydon when a speeding motorist knocked her down. Both myself and Gary ran across the road to find her on the footpath. Um, Bleeding from her head, unconscious. Uh, I think it was saying something like, uh, Lil, come on, wake up. You know. <laughs> You're going to be all right. Lillian had suffered devastating injuries and died the following morning. It was her mum's birthday. Have a good day. Love you lots, Lillian. The family's agony was compounded when they discovered the driver had been smoking cannabis. But a drugs test wasn't completed until nine hours later. He was sentenced to just eight months in prison for death by careless driving. You can be breathalyzed on the roadside, but there wasn't a, a drug analyzer or roadside testing to do exactly the same for that with drivers that take drugs. Someone needed to change that. And that somebody happened to be us. With Lillian's aunt spearheading the campaign and the help of their local paper and MP, they drew up a plan. You know, we're, we're not lawyers. You know, we were just a family that had been grief-stricken. We had the local community behind us. We just needed to be heard. Within months, thousands had signed up to their cause. The campaign was gathering pace, and they were invited to meet David Cameron. He was the prime minister. Didn't mean that I couldn't ask him the same questions I would ask if he was anybody else. What pledge are you going to make to stop this happening? In 2012, there was another major breakthrough for the family. We will be legislating properly for drug-related driving. Yeah. For the first time, a limit was set on the permitted levels of specified drugs in a driver's body. The family's persistence had paid off. And in March last year, a new drug driving law was introduced, carrying an automatic ban and arming police with roadside drug testing kits. They got parliament to listen. They got a country to listen. They changed the law uh, for one family to achieve that in such terrible circumstances. 
is incredible. Still doesn't bring Lulu back. It just prevents other people having to go through what we've gone through. Please welcome Lillian's mum and dad, Natasha and Gary, and her auntie and uncle, Michaela and Terry, the Graves family. Does it make it any better or easier in any way to know that you've managed to change things that have, will help and are helping everybody here? Yes and no. It's a bittersweet for me and Gary. Yeah. Um, everything we've done doesn't bring Lillian back. Um, but it's just a deterrent and a protection for other families out there. to present the family uh, with your award. From we stand it, it's the Mitchells, Russ Camp and Dame Barbara Windsor. Hello. Hello. You, you know, you're a family in the darkest and saddest moments mm. of your life and you turn that negativity into something positive. And that takes Thank you. Thank, you. Well, thank you to Ross and to Barbara, but most of all, thank you to the Graves family. Also winning tonight, and chosen from our 17 regional winners, was our ITV fundraiser, Ben Smith. Presenting the award were Cold Feet stars Faye Ripley and John Thompson. There you go. Ben ran an incredible 401 marathons in 401 days, raising over £300,000 for charities that tackle bullying, Kidscape and Stonewall. Bullying is a terrible thing. I think it's a problem that we all need to face up to. It's something that we need to take charge of. Coming up, His Royal Highness Prince Charles joins us to celebrate a very special anniversary. It makes such a difference, ladies and gentlemen, to have a standing ovation at the beginning. I'm very grateful to you. <laughs> this is the Daily Mirror's Pride of Britain Awards. We all wonder how we'd behave in a crisis. Would we think of ourselves or would we think of others? Well, when disaster struck, our next winner found himself having to make a split second life or death decision. And he was just 12 years old. Bradford schoolboy Dylan Graves has lots of friends, but his best mate is definitely James Yeadon. I sometimes look out for James, just in school. He'll ask if anyone's picking on me and stuff, and he'll stick up for me if someone does. But in January this year, their friendship was put to the ultimate test. It was a regular school night. Dylan had gone out to play. I was making the dinner. Was expecting him anytime soon. As the boys walked home, further up the road, an unattended car started rolling down the hill. It was picking up speed and heading straight for the boys. There was a bang, bang, bang at the door. It made me jump. James is out of breath. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan's been run over. We saw a black car that had mounted the pavement. And I just looked at James and he said he's under the car. All Dylan said were three times, Mum, I love you, Mum, I love you, Mum, I love you. And he told me later on he said it because he actually thought he was going to die. Within minutes, fire officers were on the scene and managed to free Dylan from under the car. That feeling when they've just lifted the car off Dylan and I can see my son, it was like euphoric. Dylan had suffered two fractures to his spine, a fractured pelvis and a bruised lung. Back at home, James revealed the extraordinary truth about how he had escaped unhurt. Well, and he went, Mummy, and I said, what, love? And he went, Dylan stopped the car from hitting me. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, he jumped up and pushed me out of the way. I just 
as James out the way, because I knew he would have, like, died, since he's a lot smaller than me. Dylan had risked his own life to save his friend. Dylan's actions on that day saved his friend's life. Uh, no doubt he's a hero in my eyes. Dylan has since made a full recovery, and his friendship with James is stronger than ever. Dylan is not a normal child, he's an angel. And if it hadn't have been for Dylan, then my life and our lives as we know it would be totally different. He's my best mate, and I didn't want to lose him. If I had to score him out of 10, I'd be the mate, it would be 10 out of 10. Now, you like your scooters. That's your thing, isn't it? Yeah. And you and James, and you go out, and he's on his mini bike. Just explain what a mini bike is. Uh, it's a really small bike. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. Well, you two are busy mates, so uh, here to present your award are two best mates from the world of music, Ollie Moores and One Direction's Louis Tomlinson. <laughs> Great to see you. How are you? Incredible to meet you. Yeah. Some people in your position might have selflessly just jumped out of the way, but you stood there and saved your best mate. So um, I don't think anyone else deserved this award as much as you, mate. So congratulations. There you go. Thank you. No I know, and you know that he's thanked you countless times for saving his life. Uh, but here to congratulate you once more is your very best friend. That's James Yeadon with his mum, Rachel. <laughs> And what have you got to say, James? Um, thanks to Dylan, and he's like a hero to me. <laughs> what about you, Rachel? He's my little angel, aren't you, darling? And I love you. I love oh. you forever. Hold that award. I'll hold it. I'll take that. Come on, have a little scoot. Be careful, that's it. Fantastic. Oh, they're good. Now, Dylan, we also know that you're a footy fan, is that right? Yeah, OK. Two legends of the game wanted to congratulate you, and here they are, Phil Neville and Jamie Redknapp. So keep the distance with you. That's all right, sorry, but I know that James is a Liverpool fan, so I feel a bit better oh, about right. that. Well done, James. <laughs> and also, the England players have invited you down to watch a game, and actually, the way they're playing at the moment, I would take your boots, because you might have a chance <laughs> to play. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, thank you to our child of courage, the fantastic Dylan Graves. <laughs> the Daily Mirror's Pride of Britain Awards with our partners TSB. We're celebrating a very special anniversary this year. Here to tell us more is one of our best-loved actors, Dame Maggie Smith. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've played many roles in my time. But there's one real-life role that I am delighted and honoured to have taken on, that of Prince's Trust Ambassador. This remarkable charity was set up by my good friend, the Prince of Wales, in 1976, and it's celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. Here is the story. Everybody has some kind of potential. 
The Princess Trust began changing young people's lives during the bleak days of the mid-1970s, when Britain was mired in rising crime, unemployment and homelessness. Young people generally were seen as a sort of lost generation. In 1976, the Prince, then aged 27, was serving as a captain in the Navy. He was living cheek by jowl with uh, young men. Some of them had come from difficult backgrounds, some of them had come just from poor backgrounds. They taught him a huge amount about the society that one day he might have to be king. I'd felt that uh, younger people who are of a more difficult type, more needed to be done to, to try and involve them in more useful activities. In its earliest days, the Trust funded local community projects, including youth clubs. So we allocated us £150, so we bought a pool table, um, games. The cheque came to your house, did it? Yes. My mum was like a, bank, a big balloon. <laughs> <laughs> we got it, we got it! I mean, this was relatively unheard of. Here was this Prince of Wales who, who decided to give young people money. They'll squander it, won't they? No. The charity found more and more ways to give troubled young people a boost, from residential courses to job interview training. Um, so, you want to be a postman, do you? Yes. All oh, right. As the 1980s dawned, the Trust began giving grants and advice so disadvantaged young people could start their own businesses. Everything from tattoo parlours to furniture making. I wanted to get my own business going, but hadn't got the finances. So I wrote direct to Buckingham Palace, and to my amazement, I got a, a letter back from the Prince's Trust with a cheque for £300. But as the ambitions of the Trust grew, they needed money and profile. So the Prince recruited some of the world's greatest rock stars to stage charity concerts. Forty years after it began, the trust is stronger than ever. I want to go on doing more and more. Every year it helps 60,000 young people move on with their lives. Aside from grants, the trust offers training programs and mentoring initiatives. And many of the young people the charity has helped go on to support others in need. At my lowest, I was sleeping rough on the streets. When I went to prison, I thought that was the end of my life. My mental health just completely plummeted. They gave me a future. The Prince's Trust have completely changed my life. They saved my life. One of the young people that the Trust has helped is the winner of this year's Prince's Trust Young Achiever Award. Sometimes it feels like you're always on the losing side of life, but you can start winning again if you want it enough. When Francesca Brown was growing up, life was far from easy. I struggled with the fact that I was from a broken home. Me and my mum, we didn't have the strongest relationship. She ended up living with her grandmother. I think she felt quite isolated at the time and lonely. Everything around me was just so broken. I was highly depressed. My confidence levels had gone so low. But Francesca had a passion and a talent, which gave her hope. Football made me feel really good about myself. That was my escape. She played at youth level for Manchester United and Manchester City, but aged 15, on the verge of being signed for a football scholarship in America, an injury ended her career. Everything I'd worked so hard for had just been taken away from me just like that. I lost who I was as a person. I had no strength to carry on with life. I went into a bedroom and seen the tablets on the side. I said, what have you done? Got every pill I could think of and I um, tried to take my own life. I was hoping that I was gonna go to bed that night, go to sleep and never wake up. Francesca sought help. Through counselling me, through the therapy, it just clicked for me. I said, I'm gonna make something of myself. Francesca studied community work and began volunteering at a youth centre. A lot of these girls had issues which I dealt with or I had to overcome in life. With help from the Prince's Trust, she set up Goals for Girls, a sports and personal development programme at a school in East London. Our main aim with Goals for Girls is to allow young women to build their self-confidence and self-esteem. Let's do that again! Fran is utterly determined to inspire young girls. This is about goals on the pitch and goals in everyday life.
Think about who really inspires you. Francesca has helped more than 700 girls tackle a range of teenage issues, such as body image, pressure from boys, and bullying. Francesca's taught us no matter how you look, there's nothing that can stop you. Look you! Our conference is up, I'm making friends, we all play football together. It makes me feel like a part of something. I am very proud of her because she's doing really, really well. Where's it going to go in the future? I'm hoping that we can branch out not only in L London, but obviously nationwide and touch the hearts of many more young women and show them that um, they can build their self-esteem and confidence without um, having to look at a magazine or on social me media to feel better about themselves. I wish you all the very best with that. For now, thank you, Francesca, and over to you, Dame Maggie. Ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding for the president and founder of the Trust, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. It makes such a difference, ladies and gentlemen, to have a standing ovation at the beginning. I'm very grateful to you. <laughs> Can I just say that um, year after year, the Prince's Trust Young Achiever Award has recognized the incredible achievements of young people who have turned their lives around with the help of my trust. Francesca's remarkable story demonstrates the importance of my trust's work and the impact such support can have in changing young people's lives. Well done, Francesca, if I may say so, and many, many congratulations on this outstanding achievement. Thank you, Dame Maggie. Thank you, Dame Maggie. Congratulations, Francesca. And thank you so much, sir. And we wish you all and every success with the Princess Trust in the future. Thank you so much. Coming up, we celebrate one of history's greatest thinkers. But please don't ask me to help with Brexit. <laughs> Britain Awards. Every year we celebrate remarkable people who make this world a better place and there's no better example than our next winner. To explain more, here is Mark Austin. One of the hardest parts of uh, my job is bringing you news of war and catastrophe around the world. But one extraordinary man, extraordinary man, decided he couldn't just sit back and watch any longer. And he set out to help, risking his own life in the process. This is the daily reality of being a doctor on the front line. There were many moments when I thought I was going to die. In the Syrian city of Aleppo, surgeon David Knott is battling to help save civilians' lives. We'll probably be operating for another 12 hours or so. But this isn't David's day job. He normally works in NHS hospitals in London. Every year, he takes two months' unpaid leave to bring his surgical skills to the people who need it most. For David, it's what he lives and breathes and what he loves doing, because it comes from his heart. It all began when David saw a news report about the war in Sarajevo. I was watching a man looking for his daughter amongst the rubble, and then he found his daughter and took her to a hospital where there was no surgeon available to operate on her. My heart just suddenly turned, and I thought, I'm going to go out and help him. I want to be that surgeon. David has spent more than 20 years crossing the globe, from war zones in Gaza and the Congo to earthquakes in Haiti and Nepal. 
is driven by the difference that he can make. And he does understand that it's dangerous, but he feels that it's a duty. Whilst operating on a patient in Syria, David was interrupted by so-called Islamic State fighters armed with Kalashnikovs. My leg starts to shake, blood was draining out of me, but I thought, no, you've just got to concentrate on your patient. Eventually, the men turned away and left him to finish the surgery. It, it takes a huge toll on David. He struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder. In spite of all the difficulties that he goes through, he always, always says, yes, I will go again. Even when David's back in London, he carries on his vital work, training surgeons and overseeing operations in Syria via Skype. So we want you to take an incision. He's very unassuming. He's extremely modest and humble of his achievements. I'm so proud of someone who's done such amazing, brave, bold, magnificent things in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage one remarkable man, David Knott. <laughs> David, I mean, what a reaction. I know that you were invited to Buckingham Palace and you met the Queen, and she was very concerned about your post-traumatic stress. I found myself uh, invited to, uh, to have lunch with the Queen, and so I was sitting there, and then she suddenly turned round to me and said, uh, and where have you just come from? Uh, I, I said, I've just come back from Aleppo. And she asked me, how, how was Aleppo? And there I was in Buckingham Palace with the Queen, looking at the most beautiful surroundings, and I'd just come back from the worst possible hell. And I, I remember my bottom lip starting to go a bit, and uh, suddenly she uh, looked at me and realised that, you know, that there's something not quite right with this man. And uh, so beckoned the, uh, the courtiers over, and uh, suddenly the corgis arrived. And so for about 15, 20 minutes, uh, she just talked to me and she talked about her dogs. She was really wonderful to me because she realised I was unable to speak. So it's a great thing to happen. We were born in Wales, and uh, we've got another Welsh legend to present uh, your award. It's the man with the golden tonsils, Sir Tom Jones. <laughs> David, I couldn't think of anybody else in the world that I would rather give this award to than you. So congratulations, and I must say that you are the pride of Britain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, not many people know this, but um, I was rushed into hospital 12 years ago as an emergency and, uh, and looked into the eyes of this man, thank the Lord, because um, I was a matter of hours from death, was I not, with uh, sepsis. And, uh, and David was there in A&E and whisked me off and gave me drugs for a long time to calm everything down and then did a very, very long operation on me. And I just want to say thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This year's winners have travelled the length and breadth of the UK to be here tonight, but for one of them, the journey took 24 hours, three aeroplanes and covered nearly 800 miles. It takes less time to get to Australia, apparently. <laughs> the TSB Community Partner of the Year Award pays tribute to someone who is a force for good in their local community, and that's certainly true of tonight's winner. These are the spectacular Orkney Islands, the most remote of which is North Ronaldsea, home to the very industrious Billy Muir. The 68-year-old has been declared Britain's busiest man. Blimey, is that time already? Astonishingly, Billy has at least 20 jobs. I'm not a workaholic, no, no, no. I simply like working and I have the strength to do it. 
first stop in his packed day is the island's airport, where Billy is air traffic controller. Logan 314 North Ups. Baggage handler and taxi driver. And that's not all he does for visitors. North London say holiday cottages. I want to secure a good future for this island, and I'll do everything in my power to make that happen. One thing we're not short of is wind. But there is a shortage of working labor, with just 50 people on the island. And that's why Billy's so busy. Without Billy, I don't think anything on the island would get done. I actually can't think of a job that he doesn't do. I am and Billy ready for action. He fixed your sewer system, which is pretty disgusting, but he did. He's involved in everything on this island, and everything he does is quite selfless. I do not believe that anybody has done as much for the island as what he's done. And that deserves to be recognised. The job Billy takes most pride in is making sure that whatever the weather, the island's coast is safe. It's one of my favourite jobs out of all of what I do. Finally, with all his many jobs done, it's home to his ever-supportive wife, Isabel. Where have you been? I've been working all day. Could go over a cup of coffee, please? Right, give you a cup of coffee. I will be done. Oh, the blooming phone's going there. <laughs> Hello? <coughs> give me five minutes and I'll come and see what I can do. Bum, bum. Cheerio. few times as possible, but sometimes meetings take me away or an occasion like this. Yeah. I never thought in my wildest dreams I would ever be here on this mission, ever. It's totally unbelievable. Well, we're glad to here to present your award, uh, Billy, is the gorgeous, the beautiful, the stunning Alicia Dixon and Johnny Vegas. Now, you we think indeed. you are amazing yes. running the island, but I want to know about your poor wife, Isabel. Does she ever see you? Well, she says I fall asleep when she does see me. <laughs> Is it true you went out and bought a bulldozer without telling your wife? I bought a... Jesse uh, Beaver without mentioning it to her. <laughs> Changing it from bulldozer to Jesse B doesn't change what you do. <laughs> There's a sudden difference. Where was you going to hide it? <laughs> You're really inspiration, Billy. <laughs> Thank you, you really very much. You Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations <laughs> to Billy and you. We come now to the Lifetime Achievement Award, and this year's winner is truly out of this world, Professor Stephen Hawking. To tell us more is a man who won an Oscar for his portrayal of him in The Theory of Everything, Eddie Redmayne. Why are we here? How did life begin? Can we travel through time? Uh, these are some of the biggest questions facing humanity, challenging our greatest thinkers for thousands of years. But one man has perhaps done more than any other to answer them. Professor Stephen Hawking has inspired millions all over the world with his extraordinary refusal to let his condition dictate the terms by which he lives his life. My goal is simple. It is a complete understanding of the universe, why it is as it is, and why it exists at all. Shortly after his 21st birthday, Stephen was diagnosed with motor neuron disease and given two years to live. A consultant said to him, there's nothing I can do for you, so don't bother to come back and see me again. As his body began to fail him, eventually losing his ability to speak, his astonishing mind grappled with the laws that govern the universe. He was one of the first people to take on the conundrum that is black holes. And he's been investigating black holes for many years, trying to understand how they work. The prospect of an early death urged Stephen onward. He explored complex theories beyond most people's comprehension. 
One of the big contributions Stephen has made in the, in the field of cosmology is to the question of why we're here. In the, in the sense that you ask, why is it that galaxies formed? What, what processes way back, close to the beginning of time, if indeed there is a beginning of time? Stephen's book, A Brief History of Time, has sold over 10 million copies and been translated into 40 languages. He was told that a book on physics would never sell, that nobody would be interested, nobody wanted to know. And I think he's quite conclusively proved that that is not the case. Space, here I come. Stephen Hawking is definitely one of the greatest geniuses of all time. The main qualities that have helped uh, our dad achieve what he has is a relentless positivity and sheer bloody-mindedness, I think. Stephen, one of my most treasured moments from space was having the opportunity to call you, knowing that you would have a very special appreciation of the view outside the window. Many congratulations on this award. Please welcome our Prime Minister, Theresa May. Tonight, everyone in this room and everyone watching at home is celebrating the very best of Britain. And it's my great pleasure and honour tonight to lead the tributes to a man who has quite simply changed the way we think about the world around us, while at the same time battling devastating illness for more than 50 years. His impact was shown so clearly in that film, The Theory of Everything, but there is nothing theoretical about his brilliance. It's my great pleasure to present the Lifetime Achievement Award to Professor Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Prime Minister, for those very kind words. I deal with tough mathematical questions every day, but please don't ask me to help with Brexit. <laughs> there are many children here this evening, and I am optimistic about what the future will look like when they are older. They have many things to look forward to, such as space travel, the development of robots, driverless cars, and computers that will win every board game they play. <laughs> but they also face many challenges such as climate change and the effect this will have on the world. I am sure the next generation will rise to these challenges. So let us proudly celebrate achievement however large or small, and friendship and respect. Good luck to you all. Thank you. Coming up... Fresh back from your honeymoon. Bit of pasture of tiny bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like Jason's mum. <laughs> This is the Daily Mirror's Pride of Britain Awards. We've been celebrating some extraordinary heroes tonight. And this year, no one's lifted our spirits more than the winners of our final award. They gave us an unforgettable summer. They got us cheering, and they're here tonight. Our wonderful medal-winning Olympic and Paralympic athletes. Please welcome Team GB and Paralympic GB. Britain will never forget London 2012, the greatest ever Olympics and Paralympics on home ground, and the British teams that did those fantastic crowds proud. 
This year, even for the most optimistic fans, it was difficult to believe that Team GB and Paralympics GB could reach those awe-inspiring heights again. Both games were on the other side of the globe, thousands of miles away. No home crowds, no home advantage, a different world. But the heroes of Team GB and Paralympics GB didn't just match the achievements of four years ago. In the heat of Rio, they surpassed them in an extraordinary summer of sport that saw records smashed, new heroes created, and new standards set. British men and women took on the best in the world and won again and again. It was our most successful Olympic Games ever, and Paralympics GB also went on to smash their 2012 record, almost doubling their gold medal tally. The achievements of our lottery-funded athletes established Britain as a sporting superpower. To all our Olympians and Paralympians, we proudly salute you. successful there. Did you ever think you could beat all of that? The support that we had back home has been phenomenal, so we're really chuffed with it's ourselves. It's fantastic. Ooh, love you. And what about you, Hannah? I mean, just amazing. You put four years hard work into it, and, and that's what you get out the end, so it, it's so show worth us, it. Show us, show us, show us, show us, yay! <laughs> and, of course, we have the wonderful Brownlee brothers here. Uh, Just a fabulous games for the two of you, though. You know it's special, but you've got no idea about how many people are watching. You know, it could just be a few people back home for all you know, really. Yeah. And then there was this other love story. <laughs> Here they are, newly married. Congratulations. <laughs> and are you officially changing your name? Yeah, I am. Yeah. You are. It's going to be Laura Kenny. Laura Kenny. Yeah. It's just wonderful. <laughs> Fresh back from your honeymoon. Yeah. Sound of the pitter patter of tiny bicycles. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jason's mum. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to all our wonderful Paralympics GB and Team GB. Here's the presential awards. Please welcome Sir Chris Hoy, Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson, Dame Kelly Holmes, and Britain's oldest living Olympian, Bill Lucas. <laughs> Amazing to see you. Kelly, of course, you've been a part of all of this journey to get to this point now, 2016. You must be thrilled. I hope you all agree that, you know, they have just made us have the great back into Britain again. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a big birthday in January. I will be 100 on the 16th. He was a bomber pilot in the Second World War. They've all got a twinkle in their eye, can I tell you? <laughs> Hitler deprived me of my best athletic years. <laughs> So what did I do? I went out and bobbed him. <laughs> so, Tanya, would you like to present the award to our Paralympic student? An amazing achievement. Absolutely fantastic. Well done. And Laura, Laura and Jason, one but half of the uh, Olympic team. Congratulations, and uh, well done on your award. It's been an incredible night, and here to sing us out before we hold my hand, here's the fantastic Jess Glynn. Standing in a crowded room, and I can't see your face. Oh, 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 oh. 
put your arms around me, tell me everything's okay. In my mind, I'm running around a cold and empty space. Put your arms around me, tell me everything's okay. Break my bones, but you won't see me. Thank <laughs> you.